I know it is very late. On my end, depending on where you're watching this, it might be very early for you. I don't know. Uh, but right now, it's very late. It is midnight. Um, and I am very late tonight. Uh, let's see. We can talk about why. Let's see why. Well, I'm late in two ways, right? I'm late because this is Friday's video. So I'm late um, doing Friday's video um, because I was at Michigan State with my daughter um, on Friday and Saturday. Uh, we had to be at Michigan State at 9 a.m. on Friday. And we were there, oh, excuse me, until late afternoon Saturday. So that's why I did not do Friday's video. And I said, oh, I'll just do it on Sunday night. But then I'm late tonight because um, I was working on my vision board. To be quite honest, I was working on my 2018 vision quest board, um, trying to get it finished because I won't have a lot of time tomorrow night and Tuesday night uh, to work on it. So I was trying to get the majority of it done today. Um, and I had a tragedy happen. All of my cutouts that I had spent two days cutting out are lost. Possibly someone accidentally threw them away. So I had to start from scratch with my board on everything but humanities. Humanities I had glued down. Um, so relationships, stewardship, evangelism, discipleship, ministry, and worship. All those things that I had cut out for those things um came out missing today so i start from scratch but luckily people had leftovers and so i was able to do that um and we had a minister's meeting during the vision party so i couldn't do mine then so i ended up having to do mine after the minister's meeting i didn't get home to like seven ish and i have been working on it ever since so that is why i am late um so i don't know if anyone's going to join me tonight so i'm going to go ahead and get started. We are going through the Old Testament in a year. Um, we are currently in Exodus and um, we have been working on uh, getting ourselves ready for the type of reading that Exodus was going to become because it was about to switch from stories to like a whole long list of um, things that God wanted Moses to do and build and make. Uh oh, excuse me, guys. Um, a whole long list of things that God wanted Moses to do, build, and make. So I was preparing you for the last couple of days um, that we actually. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get a better view of you here, but I was preparing you for the last couple of days that I actually did the video um, to let you guys know that the reading was going to get a little bit more intense, right? And I was trying to prepare you. Um, and it does, but I'm going to try to point out some things for you so that um, hopefully it's a little bit helpful um, to help you get it through. And I hope that you are reading the word for yourself. Hey, Regina. I hope that you are reading the word for yourself because it's so important um, that you read the word for yourself. Even when it's tedious reading, even when it's hard to get through, it's still important that you read the word for yourself because when you read it for yourself, God can speak to you however he wants to speak to you. So we left out, uh, left at verse at chapter 24 last week and chapter 24 was talking about um, how God called Moses up to Mount Sinai. Remember that? Mount Sinai. Um, um, but right before that, he had told the people everything that God was requiring of them. And they said, yes, we will do it. Twice the people said, yes, we will do everything that he said, right? And then the people said, you know what? Uh, but you you talk to God. We good. We, we don't need to talk to him, right? Um, and so when Moses went up, it looked to the people um, like it was thundering and lightning and all kinds of stuff um, on their side. But on Moses' side, it was him in a sweet communion with God himself. 
Um, so we're picking up in chapter 25 where we find out what goes on on the mountain, right? And um, just so you know, most people believe um, that all of the information from the beginning of Genesis where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it goes through that whole account of, of Adam and Eve. People often ask, where did that come from? Um, the theologians believe that Moses, uh, all of that was revealed to Moses while he was on the mountain. And that's how he was able to write Genesis and um, all the other Pentateuch books um, because of the vast wisdom. But he was able to write Genesis and write about times that were even before him because God himself had given it to him on Mount Sinai. Um, in chapter 25, um, we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant being built. And one thing I will say, um, that God is specific. And if you have not learned anything else about God um, in reading chapters 25 through 28, um, the one thing that you should have learned is that God is specific. God is specific. I um, I hope this works because I want to try to give you a picture of um, what was being built. I'm trying to find the best looking picture here on my screen uh, of what we think uh, this may have looked like. Uh, let's see if I save it, hopefully. Um, um, but there were some very good details. And as a matter of fact, our memory verse is going to be short today. It is chapter uh, 25, verse 8. And it says, then have them, again, we're in chapter 25, verse 8. Then have them make a sanctuary for me. And I will dwell among them. Did you hear that? Chapter 25, verse 8. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. And so God is promising here in chapter 25, verse 8, that as long as the Israelites made a place for him to come, that he would come to that place and dwell among them. And I think that that's awesome. And although it sounds as if that was for then um, and that it was given to a people way, way back when. I want you to understand this, that first of all, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Um, and you need to understand the same way that he is saying, I will make a space for the Israelites if they make space for me. Um, God is saying the same thing today. He's saying, if you make space for me, I will make space for you. And that's what we have to come to realize is that God wants us to make the space for him. And so if you're not experiencing God like you feel like you should, if you're not, um, um, uh, you know, feeling like you can reach God or touch, to, touch God or actually, you know, hear the voice of God or hear God when he tells you instructions, um, if you feel like that's not you, then check out whether you've really made a place for God, um, a sanctuary within you. The Bible in the New Testament says we are that sanctuary, right? A living sacrifice. We are that sanctuary. Um, and so we have to learn how to make space in order for God to come in um, and, and, and actually uh, commune with us. Jesus said it this way in Revelations. Um, he said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know, he's standing at the door knocking. It's up to us to open the door and say, yes, I have space for you. Come on in. You can sit right here, God, right? Um, if we don't make the space for God and we're just trying to cram him in with other things that we're doing and we're just trying to fit him in. Hey, Catherine, we're just trying to fit him in um, and plans that we already have. And we're not really ready to sacrifice the time necessary in order to actually meet and commune with God, then we're not going to have God dwell among us, right? We're saying if you make space for God, he will make space for you. If you make a sanctuary in your life, 
God will make space for you. But if you are refusing to make the space for him, but are expecting him to come and make space in you, you need to understand uh, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. And so we want you uh, to take this scripture, memorize it. Remember, that's chapter 25 of Exodus, verse 8. I'll read it one more time. Then have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. And again, that was Exodus 25 and 8. We go on to this chapter and God gets really, really detailed about what this sanctuary should look like, right? He gets very detailed on uh, how the sanctuary should look, um, how the things in the sanctuary should look, uh, very detailed indeed. And we have to learn um, uh, how uh, detailed God is about this sanctuary is the same God, right? I'm going to uh, post you guys a link. I'm trying to find a, a nice link uh, to show you uh, what the Ark of the Covenant may, may have looked like, but I'm trying to find a good link. So give me one second. Um, but yeah, we need to understand um, that, you know, God is the same God who wrote all of this in great detail. He is this same great detailed God today. Um, it's amazing because uh, to me, God was coming, um, taking it all the way down to, I want it to be measured 50 cubits this way and 100 cubits that way. And I want them you know, to all look uniform. I want it to look the same and make sure you use the same cloth and the same and dip all of it in bronze. And, and when you read through all of this, it's very deep and very detailed with specifically the measurements and how it was to be measured. They knew exactly what to do. They didn't have to guess. God didn't come to them and say, you know what, make me an ark. You know, we're going to call it the Ark of the Covenant. Should look something like a box in you know, be able to have some poles that carry it and, you know, work that thing out. But, you know, I just need a box so that I can put my presence in it and we're going to put, you know, Justin's bones in it. We're going to put the manna in it and I, I just need a box, right? But it wasn't like that. Um, God didn't just need a box. God said, we are making this Ark of the Covenant um, as a representation of my presence. And so this was important how it was built. Uh, let's see what this link looks like. And so here, I think this is nice. Uh, let's see. Good job. I'm going to post a link on here to see if you guys can see um, um, later. We'll see. Later, when you go click on this link, you should be able to see uh, what the uh, ultimate uh arc ended up looking like, right? But it was um, essentially um, a box that was overlaid in gold and, and bronze. Um, it had poles um, and loops for these poles to go to, through on the sides of it um, so that um, they could carry it. Nobody was supposed to touch the Ark of the Covenant. So these poles were very important. And as you will see um, at in other things that he makes, like the table, um, and in other things in the future, he makes these um, uh, loops where poles can go through so that they can carry it because it was things that were sacrificed or sanctified, I should say, to the Lord. And everybody just couldn't. First of all, everybody wasn't even allowed to carry it. And you'll see as we go on that God is going to map that out. Um, but everybody couldn't carry it, right? And no one could touch it. And so the Ark of the Covenant was built. Then they built the table and a lampstand. Um, and then they get to building the tabernacle itself, right? And I'm sure you can read all those details that I'm telling you. Um, God is very detailed. He told them exactly what to do, exactly how to do it. He told them the exact measurements he wanted um, and told them if it was excess measurements, what to do with the excess. I mean, very detailed. Um, um, but when he got to the, the uh, tabernacle, it's even more detailed, right? He tells him the quality of the material to use um, and how 
to put the material up. So don't just be bringing me anything, right? Get people to donate. And I skipped over that in chapter 25, but the first thing that he called for in chapter 25 was people that were willing to give. He said, listen, we're about to build. Uh-oh. We're about to build some things. I need the people that are willing to give. Tap into those people and tell them it's time. It's time to give, right? And God said um, in that uh, beginning verses of chapter 25, um, only those that, I, you know, um, that have a heart to give, right? And if they have a heart to give, that means God impeded on their heart to allow them to want to give, right? Um, and so... Impeded wasn't the word I should use. Impressed is a better word. God impressed upon their hearts um, the idea of giving, and they obeyed God, and they gave. And so all of these things that were made were made from the gifts that people gave to have this done. Uh, back to chapter 26, the tabernacle is being built, um, and at this time, uh, the Israelites were a nomad people. They were going from place to place. Um, no one knew at this point how long they would be a nomad people. At this point, we thought that they were going to make it to the promised land fairly quickly, right? Um, nobody knew that they were going to end up eventually wandering in the promise, I mean, in the wilderness for 40 days, for 40 years, um, which we're going to come upon that in like four more chapters. Um, so you can see why. Um, but we need to understand um, that they were a nomad people. And so this tabernacle that God was having them built had to be portable. It had to be able to be carried. And it's going to be a, a very serious thing that happens in the future uh, with one of the prophets and someone that um, he, uh, you know, uh, had told specifically, uh, well, everyone knew that they weren't supposed to touch the Ark of the Covenant uh, but then when it started to fall, the guy reached out and touched it to try and catch it, and God killed him. Um, and people were like, that's not fair. But the bottom line was, this was the Old Testament before grace and mercy. And God said, I told you not to touch it. I don't care for what reason. You don't touch it. I, it could fall to the ground, and I'll put it back together miraculously. But you don't touch it. Follow what I said. Obey what I said. All right, so God is giving them... Um, a lot of different instructions about the curtains and what materials they should be made with and how they should hang and where they should go and how long should they be and how wide should they be. Very detailed instructions um, coming out of chapter 26 about the curtains for the tabernacle. And then after those curtains for the tabernacle are uh, made, and I do want to say this, God said in more than one place um, in this passage of scripture, get the skilled workers, those that know what they're doing, basically. Get the skilled workers, the skilled workers, um, the embroiderers, people who have done this before. I don't want anybody brand new trying to work on my project, right? I want the skilled workers, the ones that have gone here before, they have done this before, and they know what they're doing. Those are the people that I want. And so um, God has him get the skilled workers, and they actually start, um, you know, sewing the curtains and doing and following the directions to a T. Um, in verse 27, um, he talks about the altar and how the altar would, would be built. Um, it was awesome because everything was going to be just overlaid with bronze. So everything was going to have this big, huge, bright look, right? Um, because it was just going to be overlaid with bronze. And so God is speaking to him exactly about what to do. Um, and then once he starts um, talking, before he makes that transition into Aaron, he says, look, um, in chapter 27, verse 20, he says, um, Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light, so that the lamps may be kept burning. In the tent of meeting, outside the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant law, Aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before the Lord from evening till morning. This is to be a lasting ordinance among the Israelites for the generation 
to come. And so he tells them that there's going to be a consistent light burning in the tabernacle all the time. A consistent light burning in the tabernacle all the time. And I think that that is awesome. But I also remember, I like to put myself in other people's shoes. And so I'm thinking about what it must have been uh, for Moses, right? And Aaron um, and Aaron's sons who now all of a sudden had this duty, um, not Moses, but Aaron and his sons had this duty to actually go and light those candles every night, no matter what state they were in. They had to keep a light in the tabernacle. At all times, they had to keep a light in the tabernacle. At all times, they had to keep a light in the tabernacle. And we're going to read about um, Aaron's sons in the future and how they started off good. But then, you know, these two boys start playing around with strange fire is what the Old Testament calls it. But we're not going to get ahead of ourselves. Then this last chapter, chapter 28, is totally dedicated to talking about... Um, garments for Aaron, right? And so here God is sort of um, letting Moses know that Aaron is going to be priest, that his sons are going to be priests, and he is preparing Moses to go back. And you got to remember this when we get to chapter 32. In chapter 28, he is preparing Moses um, to go down from that hill and anoint and consecrate Aaron as the first priest of Israel, right? Um, and so he's getting ready to do this, um, but some things are happening down there because they don't know that that's what's uh, getting ready to happen. Um, he gives them very specific instructions on how to make Aaron's garb, his garments. He, very specific instructions. Um, right down to the colors, He, uh, God says, have them use gold and blue, and purple, and scarlet. We believe all of these are some powerful colors um, that God had used, not just by happenstance, but by design, he wanted these colors used. Um, it talks about the ephod, which was the uh, thing that was placed over the robe. Um, and um, in Aaron's ephod was going to be the, uh, the 12... Um, generations um, of the tribes of Israel. And so each of the sons would be represented um, in um, the ephod. And he talks about, you know, what it was going to be made of and uh, making sure that it didn't break anybody, right? But still taking donations to be able to put all of those uh, 12 um, uh, sons of um, Jacob um, and, and with a, a beautiful stone that he talks about what stone would be connected to what name, right? Um, and then it ends sort of um, in chapter 28 um, with Aaron, with Moses um, getting further instructions about Aaron um, telling, um, um, uh, God is telling him, uh, verse 29 of chapter 28, Whenever Aaron enters the holy place, he will bear the names of the sons of Israel over his heart on the breast, um, breast piece of decision as a continuing uh, memorial before the Lord. And then he says, put the Urim and the Thummim um, in the breast piece. And so basically, this was a way um, that they actually determined what the will of God was. Um, think of it um, not like, hmm, it's always hard for me to explain what it's like. It's not like rolling dice because rolling dice, you say it's a chance, right? You roll and you're looking for lucky seven, right? Um, that's not what this was about. This was um, sort of think of um, if you prayed to God, believed God and said, Lord, I know the next decision that you give me will be the right decision and that it came from you. Um, if I roll, blah, 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 right? If I roll a six and then you roll a six and it's like confirmed by God. So it was more like that um, and more concrete even than I've said it right here. I'll look it up in different ways and try to maybe get it um, in a way that is even more com um, uh, more simple, not more complex, 
more simple than what I've just described it to you. Um, but basically, he put the tools that they use for this, they're called the Urim and the Thummim. He put those in um, his pocket, in the breast place, um, so that they will always be over his heart, right? Um, then it goes on to describe other garments um, that were actually attached to this robe um, that, uh, you know, uh, Aaron was going to receive. God breaks it down step by step, what's going to be where, who's going to wear what, right? Um, it's really good. All the way down to listen. Tell them to put on some underwear when they come to the temple because I don't want to see all that. That's what verses 42 is saying. I don't want to see all that. Tell them to put on underwear. I mean, it's just really awesome how the word of God can come forth. And sometimes we make it so difficult, but really God is talking to everyday people about how to be extraordinary in him. And that's the same thing that God does to us today. We are everyday people. God is talking to us to figure out how we can be extraordinary, right? Um, and so we've got to understand that God wants to sow into us the same way that he sowed into them. Um, and that's pretty much it for today. I know this was, again, some harder reading. Um, some of you may have found it interesting, right? Um, and that's good if you did. But understand that we're going to continue to read, um, even if the stuff seems kind of far-fetched and not uh, relevant for our lives tonight. My job, or in this month, right? Uh, my job is to uh, show you how the Word of God can be relevant um, to us now, only if we apply it, though. We have to apply it. So tomorrow we're going to uh, pick up. We're going to continue to read chapter 29 through 32. Um, and so we're going to read a little bit more. It's going to be a little boring for a little while. It's going to read. We're going to talk about the, the offerings that they have to give and the altar and the bronze basin. And we're going to talk about atonement money and anointing oil. Um, we're going to talk about holy incense and the Sabbath. And then in chapter 32, we're going to get a story. Yes, we'll be back to a story. So if you can make it through um, tomorrow with the first three chapters, the fourth chapter will bless you. I promise. And we're going to talk about that fourth chapter in detail. So until next time, you guys be blessed. Understand that I love you and God loves you too. In Jesus name. Amen.